Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. In today's episode, we interview Alvaro, who was 10th place overall at Adepticon and playing Warp Coven. Let's see what Zinch has in store for us today. We're back with the nearly buffed King of the Meta, the Warp Coven. Yeah, serendipity coming along. It was all in Zinch's plans. <laughs> just just after plan. Adepticon. He just had to lose. The poor Warp Coven players just had to lose for two years. But the time is now. The time is now. And even okay. pre-buff Elvaro here, you did really well at Adepticon. Oh, thank you. Um, to be honest, I was personally a bit disappointed with my end run. I was feeling like I had a shot at the top eight. But then, yeah, I got matched against Rob Poirier. Oh, yes. Uh, the local uh, menace. Yeah, and then I lost by one point on the first game, and I was like, ah, oh, there's so little chances of getting to that top eight. All right, well, was... we're, we're, uh, we're here uh, yeah. to talk Warp Coven with the top placing Warp Coven in the US, I think, right now, as of last weekend. <laughs> oh, Alvaro, yeah. right? Yes. Hi. Okay. Um... Yeah, even before, even before we got on to. Uh, Catching up with you, Alvaro, you know, War Coven has been doing kind of well the last couple of weeks as far as uh, me and Jason's week to week show has been uh, concerned. Hitting uh, 70 percent last weekend in Spain. And it sounds like, you know, you did pretty well. You went uh, you only had two losses, right? Uh, yes, I lost my first game at the Adopticon GT and my first game in the uh, second bracket. Yeah. All right. And, you know, coming hot off the heels of la next or last weekend's or last middle of last week's uh, data slate change, Warp Coven are off to a new start. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's be coming out on Monday. The data slate will have happened last Wednesday. And uh, how are you feeling about the buffs? Uh, my first thoughts is that it makes the band much easier to pilot and much more forgiving. Um, so I totally see the intent to make the band more approachable to new people, or, uh, make it more, uh, more tempting to be something to try out next. Um, however, the end result to me was that it feels like the band will be a little bit, a little bit less fun. Um, uh, I read the change to make the Exalted a start strategic ploy. A bit odd. Um, making it free uh, it's kind of like it sounds like it should be like a built-in rule into the team if that's the case. Uh, I, I guess you have an extra benefit of it being a strat uh, an extra strategic ploy. You get one more round to do something for free, which is always good. Uh, but yeah, it makes me think it's like what's maybe they, they are just throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, for, for listeners who don't know what happened to Warp Coven, the Exalted Astartes ploy, which has gotten buffed a couple times, I think, from when the team was released, is now all sorcerers and gunners, or all, all operatives that are not Zangors can now double fight and double shoot. Sorcerers specifically, if they shoot with different profiles, and it used to cost one CP and now costs zero CP. So basically every turn, all the operatives that are marine chassis are dangerous on warp coven especially because their gunner is probably one of the scariest guns in the game right um yeah uh the gunner is pretty solid uh rubrics are pretty solid too anyway uh the problem with the gunner um is that his second shot costs two actions so you have to be very 
very conscious about where you place him. Uh, the Rubric I Converter and the Rubric Marine Warriors, for example, they just have a weapon similar to a bolt rifle. Uh, and they can just move and shoot. So that's also, uh, that's also something that people tend to overlook that is pretty good because those rifles have AP1. So you can put in a good show by just turning a corner, guns placing, and have fun. Uh, yeah. Also, like Jason survived uh, recently in my match against him, uh, in the sense that one of his foes survived two shots of the gunner in straight yeah. in the face. So uh, it's quite a swingy weapon. Yeah, six dice on threes, three, four, AP one, and it can double shoot if you stand still, which is generally somewhat hard to get into a good position and double shoot. But Warp Coven, they do have one sneaky ploy where your sorcerer can warp portal a gunner up onto a vantage point and now it's in position to double shoot, right? Uh, yes, but this it also works the same way in Into the Dark. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a telegraph move because you have to be tossing that gun around with your uh, warp fire sorcerer, which is the one that can teleport other Units, so the opponent can definitely know uh, what you will be doing the next turn. But uh, given that the rubrics tend to be very resilient against weapons with normal damage base three, which causes their saves to be two plus, uh, you can be confident that you will put the rubric in a position where he can get a line of sight somewhere and survive one activation from the opponent to then get some retaliation. And this is basically you shoot and then go on guard on in the dark, right? Because you can no, like I, move. I, I typically take two shots if I can. Yeah, because you'll teleport I, him into a place where he can double shoot. Yeah. Um, I'm, I occasionally try to position him so that I take two shots and then if it survives, potentially take an overwatch. Mm. So I might want to do that teleporting late in my turn. So that, uh, again, the delivery can survive maybe one or two activations and then go on Overwatch. So that will be three shots on a turn. So how often do you take, like, do you ever take zero Zangors? Uh, or like, do you, uh, like, what's the most you take? And, and like, what's the spread here and why? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I wanted to go about that in the, in the total day exchange because I really liked the change of adding one wound to Zangors. In the data slate. Uh, that is very good into matchups like Felgors. Because Felgors have a chain sword with normal damage four, crits on fives, and if they don't get two crits, it means that your Sangor might get three die. So that's pretty that's pretty solid. Uh, and it makes them even more of a menace in into the dark guarding a door. So that's um that was a welcome change on my end. Uh, as for the spread, most of the times I'm running two Sangors, uh, three Sorcerers, and two Rubrics. Uh, depending on the matchup, I might flex into four Sangors or six Sangors. For example, if I'm facing Breachers, I would take four Sangors on most layouts because you only need two hits of melee from a Sangor to kill the, uh, the regular the regular breachers. Uh, or maybe if they are like one of the few um, nine wound operatives, just a crit and a normal is fine. And uh, I, I've even used this warp cab employ that allows Sangors to retain a crit if they are in combat support from another Sangor. So I might pair two Sangors, uh, three inch from each other to not to be blasted so easily. Then maybe do a chain activation of Sangors with a um, with attack ploy, assuming I play the strat ploy to retain a crit. Uh, that works pretty well to shred through able models. Um, so again, very sensitive to the layout to the opponent. Um, Are you thinking about 
maybe taking more Zangors now that they've changed Zangors to have nine wounds? Or do you feel like this is just a nice buff to the situation where you would take Zangors because the Marines are now so much more efficient compared to how they used to be? Yeah, I'm always thinking on on the 226 spectrum. Uh, this makes this the option to take six Zangors much more tempting. Uh, but again, it kind of depends on the damage profiles that I will be matched against. Uh, sometimes I I depend a lot on the rubric I convert, so I will always take it or take it on most of the matches uh, because my playstyle really depends on getting on, on getting lots of spells early in my turn. So it's very hard for me to take six Sangors and. If I don't need those spells, that's when I would consider these six angers and having the extra wound might work. Again, again, if I don't need the spells. For example, if I rely a lot on in on casting my blast spells early in the turn uh, from the sorcerer with the, the Empiric Discipline, I might not take it and go into six angers. That sounds potentially a matchup like Intercession, where Sangors um, uh, might be more interesting, but against the damage profile of like three base damage, it doesn't come that much. Maybe they survive one more crit. That's kind of very, very, very tight stats. Probably intercession and Phobos like. That's where six Sangors will be more valuable than a, an extra spell. Yeah, especially against Phobos because they have 12 wounds. A Zangor on a bad day for Phobos 12 wound operative might actually take enough damage where he dies. Yeah, yeah. I've had great success uh, with the Zangors with Blades that have Relentless, guarding other mm -hmm. against... Uh, yeah, I don't think I've seen a player who takes a ton of pistols on the Zangors, even though a bunch of the equipment are kind of for the Zangors with pistols. <laughs> oh, I, I actually run them. Um, oh, okay, all right. Yeah. What situations are you running the uh, auto pistol and do you take the equipment when you run it? Yes, uh, I definitely have tried two Sangors with the equipment that gives their pistols ceaseless and improves their damage. That's, I believe, uh, uh, in source of rounds or the damage improvement. Um, I don't know what's something about the magazines that gives them ceaseless. Uh, and it's mostly when I'm thinking about chain activations and when I'm running six Sangors, because I would take a shot with a Sangor fighter with a pistol and charge, and chain activate another Sangor to charge, uh, so I get some cheap damage in very early. Um, before the fight, and maybe a Sangor champion just shreds through a big model that already had three or four damage on it. Um, so definitely something to consider on, on when I'm running six Sangors. All right, all right. And are you enjoying, or how do you feel like the new changes to the spells are going to go? Because you were talking about how you wanted to make sure that you get spells off at the correct time. Now all of your spells are last until the beginning of your operative's next activation. So all of your curses and your temporal or ephemeral instability and your um, defensive buffs, those all last until your next activation, effectively. So you can kind of keep those up for much longer than you were able to in the past, right? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. There's an opportunity to, uh, for example, take an early activation to cast ephemeral instability, and then do not activate the sorcerer until late into the next turning point. Which means that you get some extra value uh, from that. Although I think that the uh, that they just it's that particular spell is offset. Because the data they just reduced its benefit. For example, the first ability before reduced the uh, length of charges and dashes by two inches. Now it does by one. So you might get it to run for longer, but for the same costs, but slightly weaker. It might not sound like much, but in many many layouts, those two inches means that some some operative can at most in into the dark get within one inch of the door and open it. Um, I believe actually that's what happened with my matchup against Jason here in Adepticon. Um, I cast a female instability and it posed a very difficult question for him. It's like, I will be just 
on first on turning point one, just reaching the door. But with the X range, you can reach the door and actually get some visibility into the room. So that makes that spell much less valuable to get early on. As for the buffs, I'm running them anyway. I value them a lot. Um, so it's definitely nice to be able to have, for example, the buff for rerolling defense die last longer. Uh, and it's definitely nice to get the the debuff to opponents where you can reroll all attacks onto them. Like you can cast it late on one turn, and your, your next activation, the next one, get some rerolls with a big blast. So that's always nice. Uh, however, the, there is I find also some potential for confusion because. I typically run this equipment called like the Knowledge Tome or Arcane Tome where you can learn the spell from another sorcerer. Mm -hmm. And I could, with that, I could, I, I typically run, uh, run it so that I have ephemeral instability on two sorcerers on open so that I can pick which one to activate first and cast it. And this might mean that I cast it on one turn with one sorcerer and then the next one I cast it with the other one. So I have both instances on at once. Oh, well, interesting. Yeah. Okay. That yeah. Because this now creates an extra extra layer, so you maybe can have a room where it's permanently on because the cast is distinct. And I think the wording on the cast is you cannot cast a spell that has been cast on this turning point. Exactly. But That's now you can cast ephemeral instability on one on turning point one, and then cast on two, and then just kind of chain it indefinitely. That's kind of cool. Uh. Yeah. So, uh, and if you stack both. I would assume that both instances in parallel add up to reducing it. So if I have both instances up, the first one reduces it by one, the second by an additional one. That's potentially something that will be need to be clarified mm -hmm. in an FAQ. Yeah, this, that sounds like a, this would probably be a good errata. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I hold on. Think, uh, yeah. Or until the psychic power is selected again. Okay. I think that's actually, no, it's actually there. In Psychic Powers, it says, until it's activated again. So even though it's the same spell, it gets reactivated and it replaces the old one. So I think it's actually resolved there. Oh, cool. Yeah. Even better. So we're good. All right. Anyone yeah. who's listening and was worried about Warp Coven being even more complicated, it's fine. You just only get to move one less inch. Yeah. Even better. Um, but then arcane robes, you know, now your three sorcerers are going to play closer to like 14, 15 wounds rather than the 13 wounds they currently represent, which for anyone who's played against intercessors knows that uh, five, 15 wounds is a, definitely a scary breakpoint. Yeah, yeah. Um, it definitely makes the arcane robes an insta peak. Yeah. Uh, before, I actually felt like it wasn't always something that I would consider. Sometimes I, I might go with the item that gives feel no pain on mortal wounds mm -hmm. in, in the matchup because the sorcerers tend to attract all the snipers, all the meltas. Uh, but right now, yeah, it feels like Arcane Rove will be a definitely superior pick. Um, so I've got a question about the attack ops that you choose. You've got access to security and recon, is it? And uh, mm -hmm. you get another one with the Zangors. Um, what do you typically play for attack ops? Um, uh, sorry, what was that about the Zangors? Do Zangors give you extra options for your attack ops? Or no, I... it's just no, security. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah, it's just security was... and recon. It used to be it ba was based around how many Zangors yeah. you took. Oh, yeah, that's, yep. Yeah, and that's yeah, been yeah, removed. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, it was removed, I think, last patch. Yeah, yeah. I, or maybe before, but yeah, they changed. The last time Warp Coming was changed, you could choose Recon or Security regardless of what you bring into the table, mm -hmm. right? So I believe that remains uh, the same. Um, I think that both, both have a place, uh, both Recon and Security, uh, in the kind of uh, kill team selections I make. And I use that also as an opportunity to surprise uh, my opponent. Because sometimes my opponent looks at, looks at a layout and they, they think, oh, these rooms look like super tempting. I'm pretty sure this, this Warp Coven player I'm, I'm matched against will go for like secure center line, secure, uh, no, sorry, will go for um, recon and secure and explore rooms, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like recover item and all of those. Um, and 
in that layout, in, in subsequent layout, maybe secure center line and secure the center are just as good. Um, maybe like you play kill your opponent's models while you are angling for position on the board rather than having to set models out on recon objectives that may or may not yeah. be in useful positions, right? Yeah. Yeah, and also the other way. Uh, some opponents on an open layout might see a big vantage on the center. They might see like the Octarius pump and say, okay, the easy, the easy thing to do is to go for seize ground and secure, center, uh, secure the center. Uh, and it's very easy and it's very tempting, but sometimes you have enough terrain so that recon is also as easy and they don't expect it. Um, and uh, that is, I, I believe, something that Warcoming is very good at is surprising the opponent, uh, trying to come up with a game plan that works and allows you to be creative with the, the positioning of your operatives. So um, I, I think that, yeah, both. Yeah, so you, both you, you and, switch it up and, and pretty and often. Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, and even on the same layout. Yeah, mm -hmm. and even on the same layout, uh, depending on who's attacker or defender, if I know one defender, um, I might just go. I might just go security, and if I'm attacker, I would go for recon. Mm -hmm. Just based on okay. that. It gets even yeah. that granular, huh? Can you talk yeah, about yeah. one of the what kind of boards have made your decision that granular? Um, so you've said attacker defender, but like specifically what matchup are you worried about when you have to set up and your opponent knows where you are? When are you changing your tack op selections? Because Warp Coven is one of those teams where because you have all these options, it's very hard for players to kind of get a handle on where their mistakes are. Because it could be that you're making mistakes very early, like on tack op selection, or maybe it's just like, ah, oh, you know, my operatives aren't quite reliable. So maybe if you could lay out um, like a whole story for our listeners, that might that might be a useful way to help someone learn Warp Coven. Well, probably I should use as an example my game with Jason. Um, Perfect. We love that. So, so the idea is we were much. Oh, what's the name? I think it's called. Oh, I have the cards here. Let me see. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think we were much on hold in Into the Dark. Um, so I looked at the layout and I assumed that um, uh, a Phobos player would go for the rooms. Uh, would go for secure and explore rooms. And hold is a map that allows me very easily to go into the center and swing to one room or the other. Um, and then uh, after working out, I assumed that he will go for the rooms. I said, okay, the natural choice is for him to go recon. So my natural choice is to go, sorry, uh, uh, for him to go recon dash scouting. And then I said, okay, if I just pick the, uh, the scouting option that gives me attacker, um, I can just go and stop one of the rooms. Uh, uh, make it so that it's very hard for him to enter into one room and be sure that I can have enough presence on the middle to decide. That's when I decided the plan that works for that is um, security. If I'm, if I'm having to thwart the opponent's plan, I decide where I have to be, and then I decide tack ops that work with it. So if I have to invest heavily in the center, I go recon. Sorry, I, there way, I go security. If I suspect otherwise a different opponent matchup that will just like go through the middle because it's easy to swing, let's imagine that on the same map layout, I'm facing Felgors that will be just trying to get a lot of value from their uh, leader's dashes to get a lot of uh, a lot of early movement, uh, I might not even want to face that. I might reverse myself and say, how do I thwart that? I can just flank him, try to steal his points, and go around him in the rooms. That's when I would choose uh, Recon and go for security and explore rooms and even outflank. Because I typically run both icon bearers. I run the Sangor icon bearer and the Rubric icon bearer. Um, and that allows me very easily to score outflank just as I move from the point one. I'm just like going through the rooms, going to the sides, avoiding the big 
board coming through the middle and scoring as I go. That's actually a really good point, is that the Icon Bearer just stands around and scores outflank, because you only need four APL on one of the edges to score it, right? Yeah, and uh, so it's it, it also makes it very expensive for the opponent to try to deny you that with, the, with both Icon Bearers. So, again, that's kind of where I start trying to predict what the opponent would do, try to come up with what's my best plan to either avoid the big threats or deny him the points. So if I deny them the points, then that's when I see what tag cops might work for that. Yeah, that was kind of one of the, the big points that I remember that you mentioned when we were chatting at the end of our game at Adepticon. Um, your whole plan revolves around predicting the opponent. And if you did that wrong, then there's a strong chance that you're going to lose. Um, yeah. I mean, you definitely you predicted my play very well. Um, you had like the most flawlessly placed barricade ever uh, that combined with the ephemeral instability just 100 percent turned off my alpha strike. And when you're talking um, about the Icon Bear, you're talking about the Zangor Icon Bear along with the Rubric Icon Bear. So you effectively have yeah. seven APL on both flanks that if your opponent has to go interact with them, you're like, that is fine. Because now if you go interact with those, my other pieces will blow those interactions up. And you've got a yeah. five of Invuln and, you know, good melee on both both ends. So they stand still just fine. Yeah. Yeah. And again, as Jason mentioned, like, uh, I assumed... I, I, I had to make a roll, a mental roll of the dice to see, okay, he's going into this room and maybe if I put a barricade here, if I activate my, my Temperic Sorcerer first and get the Femeral on the first action and just go into that barricade, it will make it very hard for him to take that room, regardless of how many resources he throws into the grinder, right? So I said, I can easily change that. But if it fails, I say, if it all fails, at least I can swing back to the middle. Or get some support from the middle. Okay. So, All right. So the security yeah. and the recon is kind of like a meta choice based on how you expect your opponent to be moving their operatives. When yes. people are trying to funnel a bunch of dudes right down your gullet, like the melee horde yeah. teams, you're willing to take a little bit of positional play on recon, split the edges and force them to pull out and separate. So you can kind of pick your targets. Whereas like if they're going to try to flank you, you take a strong center and just shoot out all your targets. Yeah. yeah. Also force them to make a hard choice on the synergies. Because maybe they have to split their operatives, maybe for, in the case of Felgors, maybe they have to move their Shaman away and maybe give their Super Conceal to fear operatives, so... Um, All right. Yeah, yeah those, are, those are nice strategic choices, I think, for Warp Coven that, you know, sound pretty, pretty smart, I think. How have you been finding, like, when you were building up your skills for Warp Coven, what kind of, like, tiny tips and tricks did you pick up that were consistently very good that you still use? And then which things did you kind of find as those things kind of allow you to carry some, some of your games? So, like, you know, what was, like, the easiest stuff to learn and what has the harder stuff been to learn? Because I know Warp Coven is very challenging, so, you know, maybe some tips yeah. and tricks or some niche tactics that people can use. Um, yeah. Like, niche tactics. Again... It's a double-edged sword because War Cover gives you a lot of flexibility so that you can, actually think, you can actually think of a lot of different plans and you have the choice to execute them, right? Uh, and the problem is the opportunity space that you have to search for, right? Uh, I think that the best tip I could give to somebody wanting to trade War Cover is experiment a lot. And it's fine. You will lose a, a few matches and it... Like, even in Adepticon, like, I, I tried something new against a team I haven't ever played. Uh, I said, okay, I think I will surprise him with this. Uh, I surprised them with it, but the plan didn't work. So I was willing to take a lose in an important game in the tournament and saying, okay, baby, I end up, uh, I end up uh, destroying my, my chances, but I'm willing to experiment and learn from it. That's... That's what War Coven is all about. It's about like being creative, uh, trying something new, and being bold in trying something new. Um, if you stick to always the same strategies, you will find that you lose because War Coven is extremely unforgiving. If you always play the same strategy over and over, you are likely to uh, end up being always playing rock. Uh, and when you meet paper, you'll be wrapped. Work coming gives you like maybe like a uh, a light a light rock, uh, a rusty scissor, 
and wet paper. But wet paper might still win over a very hard rock. So again, experiment, be creative, go wild, uh, which is kind of also potentially a, a hobby issue because you have to have a lot of sangors. All of the sangors have their place. Okay. There is always a map layout and a matchup where you will need the horn bearer. There is always a matchup where you will want two sangors with pistols. Vicky. So all of that. Yeah. All right, so definitely a lot of experimentation. Uh, it doesn't sound like you're ever taking the skew list of like nine Zangors. Hardly ever. Hardly ever. Uh, again, I might do it into Reachers. Um, I might do it into Red Card. Um, but it's all very sensitive to the matchup, uh, the layout. Uh, I do like six Zangors. It's just that... It was very hard for me to gig up on two spells on a turn. Two spells a turn, yeah. Yeah, if I don't need the if I don't need two spells on a first activation on turn point one and two, I let go of the icon better. I value the icon better much more than the gunner, for example. The gunner, I had very poor results, like rolling six dice, getting two hits, and then getting the second shot, one hit. I cannot put all of my eggs in one basket. If uh, so, that's kind of where I say maybe two Sangors give me more value. I can spread them out, I can block a door in into the dark, or maybe I can do a double charge and, and, and kill something super beefy with this with the humble Sangor fighter with a pistol and the a very surprisingly effectively uh, Sangor champion that can't fight twice. Um, so, okay. Um, so Sangors all the pieces, all the pieces yeah. have to work in harmony for you to get the, the warp coven really going. It's yeah. not just like one sorcerer does all of the heavy lifting. Every once in a while, each sorcerer picks up, picks up the pieces from the other ones. Yeah, yeah. That's also why I like the tone. Okay. It, allows me, it allows me to be a, a bit bolder in the case that if I lose a sorcerer with the key spell I had for the matchup, I have a backup. Redundancy is key. It is key. I found that it's, it's key to make a robust plan. If all your plan depends on one sorcerer, it's very, it's very easy for an opponent familiar with it to shut you down. Uh, or even somebody that got lucky. That is, oh, this sorcerer looks cool. I will shoot it because it's the coolest piece on the table. Because it has happened. Like, some opponent says, oh, yeah, that thing looks scary. It looks scary. I'll shoot it. And then they get a good roll and they kill it. Yeah, so that's kind of why I say in Into the Dark, I, I most of the time take the Flux Blast spell in the tome on another sorcerer, and maybe I put one of each blast spells on different rooms. And on open, on op opponents with high mobility, I might go for ephemeral instability most of the times. Um, so it depends. But yeah, redundancy is key. Yeah, so did you ever have any games where you didn't take ephemeral instability? Where I didn't play it at all? Yeah. No. Uh, I can't remember from the game. There are games where I cast it on turn point two. Like, oh, okay. So yeah. like you give it up on turning point one because you're trying yeah. to angle for a blast shot that your opponent might have to give you? Yeah, or, or I might want just to feel them, to, to get the opponent to be confident and move forward. Like if I, if I have a good guess of, as to what the opponent is going for, like if, I th if it's like uh, one of those maps where there's very little distance between deployment zones and I think, okay, they will go there, they will try to set up a charge. Maybe I want them to. And I'm I'm not casting a stability on the jump point one. I let them move forward and then on jump point two I cast it. And maybe I can charge them without them charging me. Because mm -hmm. the charges are too Pretty clever actually. Uh so that allows me to call the shots. But again a way, I, to, a way to steal initiative. Yeah. The, way, the only time I've never cast it is when my Assorted Sorcerer gets deleted too early and I pick Blast on the second tone. All right, all right. Yeah, I just remember that one game. Like I, it was like a few months ago. I lost cool. the Sorcerer too early and yeah, lost the female stability. That's the only game I didn't, I didn't play. I wanted to. I couldn't, but I wanted to. Yeah, I guess one of the other hot topics for the operatives for Warp Coven, since we're doing a deep dive today, is, of course, the Boons of Zinch, the individual buffs that your sorcerers get. 
do you also take the same perspective as you do for your game plans that certain sorcerers, you know, you should be trying all of them or have any of the boons become somewhat fixed on some of the psychic disciplines like a destiny flyer or a blast flyer? Or is it still pretty dynamic in your experience? Because um, unfortunately, Warp Coven is one of the few teams in the entire game at this point that still has roster restrictions. Because when you put the sorcerer on your roster, it has to have a single boon and you can't duplicate boons. Yeah. Um, that's actually one of the things I got to experiment the less on. Uh, and mostly it's because I have, uh, I have three sorcerer models. Okay. So uh, I, I have a few primed and ready to paint, but yeah, but... I'm very slow at painting. So essentially in my roster, uh, I have Time Walker, which gives me one extra range movement and one mm -hmm. extra attack on the Tempric Sorcerer. Okay. That's the uh, Blast Sorcerer with a Firm yeah. Roll instability. Okay. So he's and like heal. your backup. And yeah, heal. heal. So he's like the melee guy that if you don't kill him in melee, he heals back 2d, 2D3, I think, every time. Yeah, he, he can heal others. He can he can cast it on himself or on others. Yeah. So I I want the seven inches there to make to set up good alpha strikes. Seven inches meaning into the dark that you can just occasionally just reach a door, open it, and hurl a big blast at somebody. I remember uh, uh, my first game into cults was this January, and it was one of these layouts with a big wall in the midsection. Uh, maybe it was channels, one of those. The sorcerer just moved open the door and hurled a blast and cool, yeah. Big blast, four operatives, uh, two dead, two wounded. So that's why I typically put the, um, the movement on that one. Um, if I don't have a good alpha strike, I consider a lot the CP reroll. Okay. The patron uh, of destiny. Basically, of destiny. that operative gets a free command point reroll, and every time you use it, you roll an extra die, and on a four or higher, you get to keep doing it <laughs> once a turning point, and on yeah. a one, two, or three, you lose the patron of destiny, and it goes away. So basically, just like extra rerolls across that model's lifespan. I don't yeah. think this is actually one that I've heard a lot of people use. So you know, tell us how you use it. Mostly, if I have a, if I really, really, really need a flux blast. To go well mm -hmm. in my first activation. Okay, so another tempiric, another yeah. tempiric uh, boon, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was uh, going to do in this order. I typically have that on the tempiric sorcerer uh, because maybe I give up the extra inch and I do a move and dash and finish in front of a door, but make sure that I get one free reroll and maybe another one. And okay. uh, the thing about flux blast is that it has rending. And it can be surprisingly good. Uh, it's, and Into the Dark is little fives. Uh, and I might do that anyway on open, regardless of losing the little five on open. Um, if I have, if, if, I, if I see the layout and I see that a, a shooty horde has to try to gang up on a, on a building that is slightly crooked, I might have a good chance to just do a regular move with a regular dash and, and hold a blast somewhere. Okay. Uh, and that allows me to keep one reroll to maybe hurt an important operative, maybe hurt a leader, maybe uh, hurt a medic on a shooting hurt, which is very, it can be very painful to lose a medic if you depend on the shooting. Uh, yeah, so those are two things that I typically pair together in my roster. Uh, then my sorcerer that flies uh, with the wound uh is called, I think, in material flight. Yes, uh, in game yes. fly. Yeah, I typically have him on destiny, um, and I uh, and I on open. It's very good because it allows you to. Uh, I actually use it. I think very uh, heterodoxically because I use the buff to improve the reroll saves a lot, so that I can try to move around and steal objectives, and maybe sur survive a few shots. Um, this discipline also has a spell that is for attacks, hits on threes, little five, murder wounds two, which is kind of like a weak sniper, but it's 
an opening, you can just hop on a vantage because you fly, shoot the spell, and go back in. But it's not a super strong spell. So it's good to shoot from safety. So that's kind of why I typically pair flying with that discipline. Um... Yeah, just to wrap that up, uh, it's Destiny with Fly because you have two buffing and debuffing spells. So being able to fly, get around, lets you eyeball people properly because you only need visibility for Weave Fate and Twist Destiny. But that means that as a utility piece, now you can stop people from getting rerolls and give yourself defensive rerolls on top yeah. of vantage points. And then Doom Bolt, yeah. we only fire if we really need to because it's just not that reliable as a four tax on threes, three five, effectively lethal five. Yeah. It just, it's okay, but it. It either spikes high or does nothing. And I think oftentimes yeah. when I fired it, it generally does nothing. Yeah, uh, it can be very swingy. So I, I, I cannot rely reliably on that, on that shot. If it works, it's great. But many yeah. times it doesn't. That's why you're uh, willing to take a, you're t- willing to take like a flyer shot where you're like, it's fully safe. I'm going to shoot and I'm going to be behind this piece of Octarius. So I'm not invisible anyway. So it's fine. So I'll do it then. But otherwise, you're using him to get into spots to help all of your other operatives yeah. act better. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I occasionally take also, uh, I think it's Empiric Ward, which improves the vulnerable states to four on that one. Mm-hmm. Oh, on, uh, on Destiny Sorcerers? Yeah, yeah. To Basically be because of... if you Weave Fate, you get a four up save that also has full Relentless on your rerolls. So you can yeah. shot by a Plasma while in cover. And generally, I think on fours with four rerolls, you make it out yeah. most of the time. Or even AP1. If I have AP1, but I'm in cover the inbuilt force with rerolls are surprisingly good so yeah so it just turns your piece into something that you can like force your opponent to come out of cover for and then you can respond with one of your gunners basically so it's just like a nice way for you to goad your opponent out something that i like doing you know because when you play shooting teams you were talking about the medic the medic is actually very good at forcing like shoot offs but if you have a medic in the back you can get a shoot off have a guy die he disappears and then someone else takes his place and blows up your dude that yeah, would that's, that's a very valid point and yeah that's um that's my okay. exact thought process yeah no i think that's good i don't hear a lot of people talk about using the empiric ward this way so this is some good some good juice what what else have we got what else we got we've yeah, got so, uh yeah go yeah ahead. um my last sorcerer is typically on the Warfire Discipline. Uh, so I bring all three disciplines all the time. Okay. I don't, Never I don't, That's good. That's, yeah, a, that's I ha- a good one. I don't remember in my, in my past, I don't remember this year to bring in, to duplicate in a discipline. I always bring the three. Okay. Um, my last sorcerer on open, uh, I would say almost always has the, I think, incorporeal side, which gives me little five and no cover, and then write him with a flamer. Yeah. So that is uh, very, um, very helpful uh, to try to uh, clear up an objective point, capture an opponent and cover. Um, and uh, excuse me for a second. Yeah, so, you know, for anyone who's wondering, you know, the Warp Flame yeah. Pistol, if you have Incorporeal Sight, you've got five attacks on twos, two, four, range six, torrent one, AP one, lethal five and no cover which means that most operatives are just going to take a huge amount of damage and you know on in the dark you don't even need incorporeal sight so yeah uh, and that's why i picked the free mission action yeah okay. appendage on that same sorcery into the dark almost all the time all right uh, yeah i know that sometimes i even need to take the heat to get the no cover and i just run it anyway and into the dark if I anticipate the opponent to like go for fortify and I'm willing to uh, to go recon dash to steal initiative, I might still want to them not to rely on those barricades. But most of the time, I just take the free mission action on the warfire sorcerer. Okay, and that's but, for in the dark because on in the dark, your warp flame pistol automatically gets the lethal five. So there's no yeah. reason for you to take a lethal five no cover. So your warp fire pistol is switching between mutant appendage for door opening and silliness and incorporeal sight on open so that you can blow people up who yep. stand on objectives and think that, yeah, how bad could the shooting be? Because, you know, between the two of your attacks, you get a fair amount of blast one. Or, uh, you know, slash one, if you're doing it on the warp fire discipline. Because you've got your firestorm and you've got your pistol. But maybe firestorm is not a, a gun that you, a psychic attack that you use all that often. Um, I use it semi-often if I can do the... oh. Infernal Fire, I think it's called, where you, you target a visible opponent and everything you shoot into it gets re-rolled. Yes. So that is actually, that's, that works well 
with the firestorm because you're you are running five die, which means you get a lot of opportunity for crits, which are hard to block. So you can get a you can get decent damage on a sniper. Um, so yeah, yeah, and for and for people new to warp coven who've never played against a team, this is one of the few weapon profiles in the entire game that has indirect with no range restriction. So the firestorm is just. Five attacks on fours, two, two, barrage, and blast one with indirect. So if he can see you and he's not obscured, he's shooting you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I am. It, every tool in the Warp Coven list has an opportunity to be used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of what I, what I like about the team. Um, lots of tools. Yeah, you, cannot bring, you cannot bring all of them. But you have, you many, you have many tools, but you only get to bring three of them in any given match, <laughs> at least as <laughs> yeah. far as the sorcerers are concerned, right? Yeah. Have you yeah. ever uh, tried experimenting a little bit with the warp swell where you increase your damage profile to five, six on a sorcerer rather than four, six, maybe against something like commandos? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, cons I don't bring it to a tournament a lot. Uh, because, again, I, I want a lot of Sangor variability. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely good on against the model wounds. No, the Ted Wood models, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's definitely good. Um, so I, I kind of like willingly sacrifice that uh, and find another and think of another way to go into uh, into, into fighting fire weapons. Oh, also, sorry, I forgot a very important thing: the weapons uh, mm. on the sorcerers. Uh, since I like a, a lot of models, the Tempiric Sorcerer and the um, uh, Destiny Sorcerer, they are running Staff and Kopesh, so they don't have a shooting weapon. They can only mm -hmm. shoot from their spells, so they cannot Overwatch. That's actually hard. That's what, I, I, I don't know if most people run like two Sorcerers with the Swords and one with the Warflamer. Uh, that's the way I typically run them. And sometimes I, I actually would prefer to have another Sorcerer with a Bolt Pistol to get an Overwatch. Um, so but this yeah, is a situation says. where you're a little bit roster locked and you don't have the space on your roster to have another sorcerer with a similar loadout with a bolt pistol because yeah. you only get one boon, one sorcerer, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of where I'm actually thinking that I'm very interested in trying out uh, a sorcerer with, I think it's called crystalline, which means that your, save, your normal saves are two ups with mm. a bolter and a staff. Or having him on the second option, um, the warp soul, the warp soul, so that you have the bolt pistol and the staff with the warp soul. Um, you maybe get less crits, you don't get the reroll, but you can do some shooting, and then you have a pretty good chance of killing an operative with ten wounds. That's the that's my thing to try to finish painting next. Uh, an experiment with the sorcerer. I think he has. It has a lot of places where I needed it. Like after the game, I finished and I played my ga my plan and I said, this plan was inferior to having a sorcerer with the warp soul. And this is really because you're losing out on a chance to charge, fight, kill a dude, be in a position where you shoot someone and then have yeah. an overwatch to finish someone off. Because with example, two yeah. melee weapons, you're much more consistent in melee, but you give up the off chance to be able to kill a weakened operative and put yourself in a position for a new overwatch angle. Yeah, that's one of the examples. There are a few others. I don't remember right now because, uh, but it happened to me in Adepticon. Like, I finished a game, I won it, but it could have been super, super easy if I had finished a charge and then be able to overwatch if the opponent fall, fell back or something. Okay. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult team with basically a jillion options. And there's, I think every single Warp Coven player probably has a different idea of what they want on their boons and their sorcerers, right? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I'm kind of new and I don't know a lot of Warp Coven players, so I couldn't share ideas. <laughs> it might actually be one of these things where maybe because you don't have as many Warp Coven people influencing what you're taking, you were able to find stuff that works for your playstyle and kind of sculpt your own playstyle, which is something that not a lot of teams give you the option of, because I know that me and Jason have talked about how roster restrictions basically don't exist for most of the teams, but Warp Coven, your roster restrictions definitely change how your matchups play out as far as like the rest of the game goes. Yeah, yeah, uh, and... The thing I was just discussing is actually a hard choice for me. Like, bringing a sorcerer with a pistol 
uh, I would put at least two different boons of cinch on it to make it flexible. It means I lose two sangors. Uh, so it's it would be very hard. Uh, I would have to lose probably the sangors with the pistols because the sorcerer with the pistol would have to try to fill in for them. So hard choices. Yeah, I think this kind of boils down to the theme. I think it's very thematic because you have to have a plan for everything. It's very cinchy. You have to have a plan for every operative, and every plan needs all of the right operatives in your roster. Yeah. Do you have a preference on which Zangor champion you take, or do you switch them off? Because I know this is another thing that I generally think people generally just take the great axe i would assume but it sounds like you play around with your zangor choices a lot more than i have heard people do so you know do you pick the great axe versus the great blade basically passing up brutal for reap one because those are the two choices there yeah 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 well recently i've been picking the brutal one a lot but that's because i've been i've been planning to have the zangor champion accompany a sorcerer okay Tell, uh, tell, me, tell us why, uh, you know, the brutal work makes more sense with a sorcerer floating around. Uh, well, the problem is that the Sangors are Glascanos, right? They do a lot of damage, mm -hmm. but they don't have a lot of wounds. Uh, the, Not yet. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, even then, we, yeah, with nine, it's, it, it will be better. Maybe it will lean me to the um, uh, Great Sword a little bit, the Great Blade a little bit. But the thing about brutal is that they can, it's very hard, it's much harder to parry. It just makes your uh, melee steps way yeah. more reliable. If you send yeah. in your champion to go fight two dudes, if you've got four dice on threes, four, five, brutal, lethal five, you're way more likely to deal with a single eight wound operative just because it's way less likely yeah. they can parry out. Yeah. Whereas like with the great blade, they can just push one of your attacks out of the way. And if yeah. you only land the two hits, it's not enough. Yeah. So the thing is that the great blade is very great at clearing up a door. Mm. Somebody, maybe they set up two operatives and they say they will have to waste a lot of time uh, to go through this door. I've seen it. I exp uh, I've seen players just put two hum humans, human operatives on the door. The Great Blade rips them because you can fight twice, you have the rip. Uh, or, or maybe, for example, novitiates. Novitiates are very prone to putting a flamer behind a barricade with something else. You send the Great Blade in, you will do a lot of you will cause a lot of hurt. But the uh because if if they go for parrying, at least maybe you get a few rips and you weaken them both. The great tax I typically take against more elite circumstances where they know that they they can they could parry to try to outlive the Sangor. The Sangor after all has four attacks. And maybe lots of elites have fire attacks. That gives them a lot of opportunity to out parry. I don't count on crits. Uh, I don't. I don't count to get the little fives to pop up. So brutal gives me much more reliability when going through this. That's kind of my my thought process on the great blade versus the great axe. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, are there any matchups that you feel like? This patch has actually helped you because, you know, we've been talking a lot about Warp Coven, how to get better Warp Coven, what your favorite things are. But now that we've have this data slate, you know, like the third in the row, I think that it's pushed Warp Coven up just a little bit. You know, where do you feel like this patch has helped you out in matchups where maybe you were struggling? Like, do you see any games where you've lost or they, the games were close recently where these changes would have made the difference? Um... In my recent matches, I think that the babysitting range on the icon bearers is gives you much more flexibility in positioning. So the way it worked before is that your rubrics have APL3 as long as they start their activation six inches away from a sorcerer. Right now, they changed it to be nine. So that means that if I lose a sorcerer, uh, but I did my positioning right, another sorcerer can step in to do their work but also babysit two rubrics. Um, so that's um, that's something that would give me more uh, more freedom when I do my deployment. 
I can I can maybe be more ambitious more ambitious when I try flanking strategies. Yeah, and like the tether on the on the nine inch radius is gonna make for an eighteen inch bubble. And that's gonna cover like half the board. Yeah. Yeah, two sorcerers in the midboard basically cover almost the entire map. So one sorcerer can now go on the suicide run he needs to to like kill a dude in melee and then flux blast and explode and kill kill a pile, right? Yeah, or, or just steal a point. Maybe I realize early on that I need to really, really, really steal a, an objective that the opponent has on their backline. My sorcerer with flies will just fly in, do their best, and the rubric will no longer be sad to be alone. <laughs> Somebody can come, like, uh, motivate. Motiv- give, yeah, motivate. Give yeah, a pep talk. Yeah, the pep talk. Rouse the spirits a little bit. Yeah. Let them know that yeah, there's but- more than just dust. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you are dust, but I still love you. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so that's that's where I that's what I think will change my playstyle a lot. Uh, then the next thing that will change me is that I will I will go for first activation ephemeral instability less. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm freed up. Yeah, I, I might still do this thing about uh, trying to position myself so that I. Do a female instability on turn point two to prevent charges to be able to charge myself. Like that's where I would, if I bring in six Sangors, I would play for that. I would try to cast a female instability, then the horn, the Sangors horn bearer will do their their horn blowing so that Sangors get one extra inch movement. So that I might get some nice charges with the Sangors that are that now have nine wounds. That that would make that potentially more. More interesting now versus just going for a female instability first activation turn point one so often as I as I do. Those I, I think would off the top of my mind the, the changes I foresee in, in my playstyle. Yeah. Anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I feel like I have so many options and like situations to speak about, and I don't want to worry with that. But yeah, uh, it's like no. I think that's that's why you're here. You're the yeah. you're our warp coven specialist on as the warp coven hit their upswing because I think basically for the last two weeks warp coven have been doing reasonably well week to week, and I think they even did like did pretty well at Adepticon, and then in Spain they had like a I think a five one one record or like a five uh, yeah, it's basically they had one loss and a tie. So they were like in striking distance. I think they lost their final game to be in the podium. So I think there are some legs for Warp Coven players. And it does sound like people are, I suspect, are using far fewer Zangwars than a lot of people have been experimenting with. Because the common meta choice has been that Zangwars are more important than rubrics because they can stand around, do objectives, and they're reasonable in melee. But it feels like for the people who've been doing better, they've been hanging on the elite side a little bit more because now you can double shoot with your rubrics and AP one on double shooting is quite good and your spells are pretty good. So it feels like there's like an uptick on maybe there's a new conversion on what does work for warp coven. And it's not taking four or six Zangors all the time. It's taking two yeah. and then making sure that your tight hammer is pretty good while your Zangors just kind of force your opponent to interact with them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I do. I do see that. I, I do see Exalted Astart is being free, incentivizing players to take more rubrics and to go on the six marine composition with the rubric gunner, the echo better, rubric warrior. I'm I particularly am not interested in that right now because the rubrics are very slow. And I I don't try to want to rely on my dice rolls. I don't want to rely on my attacks hitting at the right time. Um so I try to place a lot of emphasis in positioning. Um, if and if I only have one teleport, I'm always I'm teleporting the gunner or the icon better, not the extra warrior. So most of the time I will still think I keep the that um, warrior down, unless unless I see a game plan where I want a lot of overwatches. So I want like two shots from the rubrics and then I get a few overwatches from them. Uh, but again, um, I will have to explore it. Uh, it's not the most enticing situation to me. I just want to keep around playing with the with different deployments in my same play style, just leveraging the extra babysitting range. So 
we've been talking a lot about Warp Coven, but generally on this podcast, we like touching base on a couple of teams. Are there any other teams that you've enjoyed or maybe that as you were playing them, you thought that some of this play process could be incorporated into your Warp Coven play style? Or has it been Warp Coven all the time, baby? Yeah, for the past four months, I've been only playing Warp Coven. Um, since I'm relatively new to this game, uh, I thought that I would just be consistent and try to learn it uh, consistently and uh, just try to get better. I want him to be better, able to enjoy the game. Um, I've been recently playing more Bedguard, Commandos, and Felgors. Um, uh, oh, mostly... A little bit of uh, an amuse-bouche of teams that got nerfed today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, to me, the Bedguard buffs seem a bit heavy-handed, but they will. I think they will still be a solid team. Um, I, I, but yeah, uh, I've been playing those. Maybe I cursed them. Maybe was Siege saying like, "No, you shouldn't consider them at all. <laughs> Stick to Warp Coven." Yeah, we attempted. You attempted to flirt with some other teams, and all yeah. three of them got nerfed yeah. immediately. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't. I like them, but I like Warp Coven the best. Uh, I've been playing them mostly to uh, help some new players get experience. So I bring them because I think they are very. They represent a lot of the kill team soul. Like Bedguard is a very solid um, long game uh, band. You want to like play for the long game position. So it's a it's hard to play because you have a lot of relatives for a new player. But at least I can show them how positioning works on a hard team. Uh, commandos, I think I, I I always bring them because there is a lot of commandos going around. In tournaments, but um, they also they, cover. They, 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 yeah, sorry, go ahead. They cover like many aspects of the game very nicely. You know, yeah. like they're good at melee. They force you to interact with conceal rules for. So as far as like having a player learn how to play the game, you're like, look, I'm in yeah. conceal. This is this feels rude when I can charge you out of conceal. Yeah, exactly. The fact that there's you've got. Goodness. Yeah, there's like there's like it gives you a lot of the feelings, and the models are cool. So you know, people yeah. generally. I think at a casual level, people are fine with commandos. At a very competitive level, people are sick of commandos. So it's, yeah. it's good that they got the... I suspect it'll be good for everyone that they got touched. And then Felgor, it just shows you, like, this is what this is what Mela looks like. Yeah, yeah. That's also why I was playing Felgor, to show them, like, okay, this is this is the summer of melee. Or it was the summer of melee until today. Um, this is how a melee-heavy team works. Um, to me, to, to be honest, Felgor... They are fun, but I don't play them a lot because I think I will get bored. I, I got the feeling that I would always play the same plan over and over again. Um, so, yeah, that's that's not Cinch's way. That's just not. Um, I really want okay. to like, to get creative. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of why I, I've been eyeing next Blades of Cain. I think Blades of Cain... Blades of Cain uh, is very fun. Yeah, they, they scratch that each where you have a deep roster, you can adapt to different layouts, bring different operatives. I really like the theme, uh, that, which is very important to me. I have to connect with the theme. Uh, yeah, I, I quite like them. I've got my own Warp Coven that I think I'm going to dust off quite soon just because I think playing, you know, playing playing with a six rubric sounds fun. And I have exactly, I think, three and three. So. Yeah, I mean, they will shoot very hard. Because AP1 in those three rubrics... You want to double shoot? It's definitely nothing to scoff at. And, uh, yeah. you know, I'd be... I'd probably be using the 5-up save and a 4-up save to, like, bait people out. So the 5-up save would sit in cover, on engage, and get the full rerolls in cover, while the 4-up save would kind of, like, sit in camp. And then the ephemeral instability guy would be in the back healing the two of them. Because I'm pretty sure 5-up with four rerolls in cover can take a fair amount of dice. Yeah, it can be swingy. But both sides, they can just be, you get like two fours or you will be doing pretty well and just a healing will keep them fresh throughout yeah. the match. So I think there's there's some room there and I've got the models, so I might as well play around with them. All right. Uh, you know, before you head out, it's a uh, talk about your local scene. I know that you and we connected through Rob. I mean, obviously you and Jason played at Adepticon and that sounds like it was very fun and very silly. But Rob was on here not too long ago and talking about the Dice Dojo. But if you wanted to give a call out to your scene or any friends that you've, you've played around with in the past, you know, now's, now's the time. Okay, yeah. Um, 
like I would say like three quarters of my enjoyment of this hobby is uh, my local scene. The people at the dojo, they are they are great. Uh, very personable people, very patient. They had a lot of patience when I was starting out. Um, so yeah, definitely a shout out to Rob. That um, that was my first game ever. Uh, a big shout out to Eric Miller that brought courses into Adepticon and had a very good run. Uh, I consider Eric my sensei of kill team. Um, and my the good thing about my group is also that I think they lots of them are also willing to experiment. So they come up with new bands. They try to be creative. Um, uh, it, 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 I remember like the excitement when Inquisition came out because I said, "Oh, look! I can explore this. I can try breachers. I I can try castle kill. And maybe, maybe they know that something is suboptimal, but they try it anyway. They want to like uh, bring something new to the to every game. Um, so like when I'm playing with them, uh, I'm not I'm not super in a super competitive mindset. I know that we are just having fun." And we're just trying to uh, have a good time and like maybe even like learn one rule better every game. Um, there is a very good banter going on at our own Discord channel. So yeah, uh, all good things. Uh, a very, very friendly and amenable local scene. Yeah, we'll make sure we got a link to the Dice Dojo's Discord in the chat for anyone in the Chicago area, if I remember correctly, because that was actually where I, I visited actually way, way back in the past. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any uh, any last things, Jason, that you want to poke our just our guest on? Um, I mean, I feel like it. It you covered everything I was asking about. It. I mean, it really sounds like the takeaway is just like be a genius. <laughs> <laughs> no, Truly, no. the biggest brains succeed no. the most on Zinch. No, no, it's not about the big brain. It's about maybe it's about be a scientist, be a guilting scientist, experiment. Try it out. Um, I definitely do not consider me uh, a big brain player. I make silly mistakes. I misposition operatives a lot. I say, oh, yeah, that guy is safe there, and they are not. Yeah. But, but that's where also where just like being patient and having exp- being very patient and being willing to learn of every move and every opponent. That's, that's, my, one of, that's my one big, big thing that I always have at the forefront when I'm playing. Uh, just have fun and like yeah maybe learn one cool new move or discover one cool new move or like see an opponent do a cool move and say oh what will I do now what will I do next against that move Cinch, Cinch gave me Warp Coven to play with that to come up with a plan alright and as we know it does always go just as planned <laughs> yeah yeah I, I know whenever I lose it went as planned. <laughs> Not as my plan, but somebody's plan. <laughs> Zinch is plan to tank the win rate to get these buffs. Yeah, yeah. It, it worked. It <laughs> yeah, it worked. <laughs> Playing the long game. All right, Alvaro, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you a lot for having me. Uh, it has been a blasting here turning out the uh, two main things of the Kill team and also hearing your thoughts on all the meta and, and how I've come and fit into it. And thank you listeners for listening until the end. 